Welcome everyone. My name is Kunal Shah and you're watching The Curious Show, a show all about uh, being curious about our world and learning through discussions with my guests from around the world. My guest today is Professor Fiona DeLondres. Fiona currently is a professor of global legal studies at the University of Birmingham, UK. Fiona's research and test teaching interests are broadly in the fields of human rights and comparative constitutional law, focusing on counterterrorism, reproductive rights, especially abortion law, and the development and domestic impacts of the European Convention on Human Rights. And Fiona undertakes her work through academic scholarship, public engagement, and political advisory work. There's lots more. I encourage the viewers to uh, check out her bio online, but I want to spend more time listening to her. So today is a unique type of format. Uh, and we are discussing this case, Supreme Court case in the US, uh, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. My non-lawyer way, I would summarize it as uh, the case concerns Mississippi's law that prohibits abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy with certain exceptions. Uh, the case was uh, argued in the US Supreme Court on December 1st of last year. This video is not about unpacking the oral argument. It's focused on one of the briefs that Fiona co-authored that was submitted to the US Supreme Court. Now, a quick word that I should mention on why discuss on Amika's brief. And I think at least for two reasons. One, it uh, provides an opportunity to go beyond the oral argument that many people may have been interested in in this case, and then make the transition into understanding the world of briefs. And also an alternative medium to uh, reading the briefs, just making it accessible, different perspectives and viewpoints. So then people can uh, come to their own conclusion. With that, my first question to you, uh, Fiona, who has written this, uh, co-authored this brief with five other uh, professors from Europe. Could you please uh, very briefly uh, provide the background on this case and but mainly start with the interests, uh, going with the format of the brief, uh, the interests of the Amiki Curia in this case. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for your interest in our brief. Um, so we are all law professors, uh, the co-authors of this amicus brief uh, with specialisms across human rights law, in some cases, uh, reproductive rights law and medical law uh, in other cases, and some of us across both, uh, both fields. So an amicus brief, as I'm sure your viewers know, is a brief to aid the court. So you don't argue for one outcome or another outcome per se, uh, but what you do is you, you file a brief that aims to elucidate for the court a particular point on which the Amici have some kind of expertise. Um, our brief is filed in support of the respondents, in support of Jackson, um, but we don't argue the merits of the case, if you know what I mean. So uh, we're, we're talking instead really about the European Convention on Human Rights um, and about the kind of status or general state of abortion law across the 47 states of the Council of Europe and within the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights itself. And in many ways, I think it's important just to note that our brief really was inspired by briefs that were filed either proportionally, purportedly neutrally or in favor of Mississippi in support of Mississippi, uh, which purported to present a view of European human rights law that we thought was incomplete. And so we sought instead to present a fuller and more complete account of this body of law for the assistance of the court. So in a sense, uh, it would be fair to say it's it was in response to two other briefs. And so to that end, could you talk about uh, the summary of the main argument uh, as presented in the brief? Yeah, so the there were a couple of parts to it. Um, and, and in essence, what we wanted to do, as I said, is to try to communicate the state of law uh, within the Council of Europe. So the, you know, there's maybe three or four points that we make, and I'll just summarize them. The first point that we make, um, but the first point I'll talk about here is to just make clear that as a matter of European human rights law, access to abortion or decisions about continuation of pregnancy are recognized as engaging the right to private law, 
sorry, private life under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. In other words, if a country makes a law that restricts or interferes with your capacity to decide about the continuation of pregnancy, then the validity of that law must be tested against the requirements of Article 8, the right to, uh, to private life. The second point, so that's the first thing is to say, you know, the convention applies to these kinds of laws. Um, the second point that we make is to say that the court, the European Court of Human Rights approach to these laws has been in general to recognize that states have a wide margin of appreciation. Now, margin of appreciation is a doctrine that's quite particular to the European Court of Human Rights, but it's analogous to discretion. Let's just say it's something like discretion that the individual country has a margin or a zone of discretion in which it can decide on what the law should look like or what the law should provide. And as long as it stays within that zone of discretion, it's compatible with the convention. Now, in the case law on abortion so far, of which there's not very much before the European Court of Human Rights, the court has said that states have this wide margin of appreciation, so a lot of discretion about whether they permit abortion uh, and in what circumstances they permit abortion. But two things flow from that. <laughs> the first thing is that it's very clear from the case law that if a state permits abortion, it must ensure that abortion is truly accessible in practice. So you can't just say it's legal and then not have a process to access it or obstruct its access. And the second is that this wide margin of appreciation is based on the fact that the court's view to date has been that there wasn't a sufficient consensus across the European states and indeed international human rights law in favor of saying a certain amount of or in, in favor of saying that abortion should be permitted in particular circumstances. Now, that consensus in fact has been growing. And uh, so this is another thing that we show in the brief and there's, there are further briefs that seek to do this as well. But one thing that we show in the brief is that since the last really major decision by the court, which was A, B and C against Ireland, so the last one that challenged whether or not you should be required to permit abortion, in A, B, and C against Ireland, the court recognized that actually there was a European consensus, but that the national, the Irish consensus, perceived consensus could override that. That's a very simplistic telling of it, but let's say that. And we show, well, actually, since that case, not only has the consensus in favor of liberal abortion law become stronger in Europe, but it's also become stronger in international human rights law. And there's a brief you're viewers may be interested in by UN special procedures that show that, which is really important. And, you know, it, the Irish case would be decided differently today, because as you may know, we had a referendum in Ireland that overturned the constitutional bar on abortion. So the argument that we're making there, and this is what's lacking, I think, in the briefs we were responding to, is to say the extent of a state's discretion can narrow over time. And it has narrowed over time in other areas like trans rights, for example. And as consensus strengthens, the margin or the zone of discretion gets smaller. So it's evolving. Therefore, it's not accurate to say to the US Supreme Court, this is the law in Europe, full stop. In fact, it's more accurate to say the law is evolving. And as social and legal consensus changes, so too, the law changes. Um, sorry, that's a big point, but that's the majority of the brief. And then we also make two important supplementary points. The first is that the fetus is not and has never been recognized as a person under the European Convention on Human Rights. We needed to make that point because one amicus brief in favor of Mississippi suggested that it had been, and that's not accurate. And finally, to point out that in some cases, the European Court of Human Rights has recognized that restrictions on abortion um, can in fact be so detrimental as to constitute torture in human degra and degrading treatment or punishment um, under Article 3 of the Convention. 
that was a rapid, rapid wrap up of what we say, but those are the, they're not really arguments, you know, the primary points, the primary pieces of, um, of kind of expert knowledge that we thought it might be helpful for the court to have before it. You mentioned, uh, the, you referred to the concept, which was a positive obligation, I think, which mm -hmm. the way I understand it, which you mentioned was if a government is interested in respecting a conscience claim objection of one party or a group, then it also has a responsibility to make sure that it does not impose barriers on the other side. Is that somewhat, is that, can you uh, talk about that? So it's, it's not particular to the context of so-called conscientious objection or refusal based on purported conscience. The European Court of, the European Convention on Human Rights has a doctrine within it known as positive obligations. And the idea there is to say that a state's duties under the convention are not merely negative. So let's say in terms of the right to life, the state's duty is not merely not to cause someone to die. There's also a positive obligation, which is an obligation to take reasonable steps to prevent death. So things like <clears throat> having appropriate law in place, having good policing responses, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Now, in the, <clears throat> pardon me, in the context of abortion, um, there have been a couple of cases against Poland or Ireland where people have claimed, uh, applicants have claimed on paper, I should be able to get an abortion. So both countries have, kind of had, well, Ireland had, no longer had, but had kind of very, quite restricted laws in terms of abortion. But there were li very limited circumstances in which abortion was permissible. But in these cases against Poland and Ireland, the applicants, the women, made the point that there wasn't a clear process to determine whether you actually qualified under these limited exceptions. And there wasn't a process or a system in place to ensure that even if there were a process, doctors, hospitals, institutions couldn't put barriers up in front of you so that the process was basically unusable. Right. Um, and the court held in these cases, so if, you're, if your readers are interested, they're looking at cases like Tysiak against Poland, A, B and C in Ireland, PS in Poland, RR in Poland, that the point here is that if a state provides that abortion is legal in a particular case, then the state has an obligation to ensure that abortion is actually accessible in those cases. And that means, you know, regulating institutions, ensuring there are pathways to care, ensuring that the law is clear, you know, that there, there is a clear law uh, in place in respect of it. Um, and so that's the kind of positive obligations piece of the puzzle. You have basically summarized it really well, but any, I any final thoughts on this brief before I go on to a couple of other questions? No, I think that's that's a good that's a good summary of it. Just to say, of yeah. course, it's available on the US Supreme Court website and on the University of Birmingham website as well if people uh, want to read it. And this case is pending adjudication, so I don't know how much you can or cannot comment on it, but I'll ask and you can let me know that <laughs> okay. you can or not. I was interested in your thoughts on the harms and impacts piece of the of this case, but maybe even in the European context. And I ask this because I believe you have done some work in this area and maybe familiar with it, like in the Northern Ireland context and in other contexts, but could you talk about the harms faced by the vulnerable? I mean, I would, I think this case affects the vulnerable sections of society mainly uh, if the laws are really uh, restrictive. So could you talk on that? I mean, I can speak, you know, generally, let's say, about the harms of restrictive abortion laws. And I think the first thing to say is that although the harms are often unevenly distributed, by which I mean poor women, people who live in rural areas, um, sometimes adolescent women, women with disabilities, in some contexts like the US, uh, women of colour, you know, maybe disproportionately and often are disproportionately affected by these laws. Restrictive abortion laws affect everyone. Um, and they, and I mean by that, that they manifest harms or create harms for all people who can become pregnant, whether they are pregnant or not, 
whether they wish to continue with their pregnancy or not, and for whatever reasons. And it's it's partly, you know, because a, a restrictive abortion laws have lots of knock-on effects. So in some cases, it means that essential medicines like miso and mifo are not available for licensing and they're used for things like miscarriage management as well as abortion. In some cases, some settings, it means that there's very little availability of fetal diagnostic testing um, because people, you know, the system doesn't want people to know if there is a fetal anomaly that might result in them seeking um, an abortion. So nobody can access fetal diagnostic testing. Uh, you know, so I mean, it goes, and of course, if you're not pregnant, um, and you know, you're you're thinking about maybe the possibility of pregnancy, yeah. the availability of abortion, um, should you need it, or the unavailability of abortion, should you need it, is a factor that women and their partners take into account when they're making what we call pregnancy intention decisions. So. I do want to make that point that restrictive abortion laws are harmful at a systemic basis and level uh, and not only for people who actually are seeking abortion, but of course people who are seeking abortion experience these harms in very acute and particular ways. There is, you know, there are thousands of empirical studies that show that restrictive abortion laws are associated with delayed abortion, which can increase complication, uh, cost, travel, stigma, judgment, harm, ill treatment and abuse within health systems, exposure to abuse and exploitation from people who are offering unlawful abortion services, increased maternal mortality and morbidity, you know, like there's, there, it's, the harms are extreme. Uh, well, I shouldn't say extreme. The harms are substantial, is the word I would prefer to use. And uh, they are widely distributed. Um, and they also are system harms, you know, so if you have higher levels of mortality and morbidity, higher levels of unlawful abortion, um, insufficiently trained medical professionals, because you don't teach people abortion uh, in medical schools if it's not legally available, in, on, a, on a general basis. You know, there are significant system harms that emerge from restrictive abortion laws as well as system costs. Um, and of course there is this sort of intangible, but nevertheless really significant societal harm that emerges from what a law that seeks to restrict your capacity to decide on the continuation or not of a pregnancy says to women, you know, says about agency, autonomy, uh, trust, recognition of women's lived experiences. It makes women also very vulnerable to the use of pregnancy as a control mechanism within abusive relationships. Uh, you know, one of the things that abusive men do when they feel that a woman is about to leave is they get her pregnant. You know, this is, these are important things that, you know, we have, we should be thinking about when we're trying to understand the multiple complex social system individual harms that emerge from restrictive abortion laws. Wow. Before I ask my last question, one question that comes to mind, which many people may have asked you, and as non-lawyers, I'm I was wondering is, is there which countries would you say is close to your ideal system of abortion laws, or which are which are your best systems that you think uh, you know, that you like? And acknowledging the fact that you know these systems are in a dynamic state in a democracy, evidently as evidenced by this case itself, laws change, but. Is there any countries that you like uh, currently? I mean, I'm not going to say that there's you know, a model of an excellent abortion law, but there are features of different countries, laws on abortion that um, are likely to maximize both health outcomes and human rights enjoyment. So it's actually, it's not about whether I like them or not, right? It's, do they maximize the good um, in, in terms of, you know, uh, 
uh, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health reproductive agency, autonomy, and so on. So I would mention, for example, um, countries where there is access to abortion without restriction as to reason, sometimes called abortion on request. Um, you know, that's those systems where you don't have to prove grounds, uh, you know, tend to work very well, both for the health system where there's reduced bureaucracy and for pregnant people where there isn't a need to justify. Instead, you can focus your energies on making a decision, you know, based on your values, preferences, life circumstances, other obligations, and so on. Um, so, so I think that's a that's a very positive element where that exists. Um, it's for me critical that abortion care, like all other essential health care, should be free to everyone at the point of access. Um, so situations or countries where there are financial barriers to access to abortion, you know, clearly finance poses a significant problem. Um, and there, there are numerous problems, but one is also rent seeking, you know, that some medical professionals will not provide abortion in public hospitals, but they will provide it for substantial payment in private settings. You know, that's, you know, not ideal or, or desirable. So free, fully a part of universal healthcare free at the point of entry to everybody, I think is really critical. And we also have to remember that abortion care is comprehensive. So it's about contraception, information, the availability of abortion, post-abortion care, uh, you know, pain management and so on. So systems where actually it's designed as part of a comprehensive system, you know, looking at the continuum of care and the different pathways and really centering the person who is pregnant. I think um, also that's, uh, that's very, um, a very positive way to approach the regulation of abortion. Um, and the final thing I'll say that you see that makes a big difference is ensuring that medication abortion is widely available. You know, abortion very rarely needs to be surgical. In most cases, medication abortion self-administered at home with support is the best, well, not the best, but is you know, an appropriate approach to the provision of abortion care. And for many women, it's their preference. Um, but a lot of countries regulate abortion against some kind of very outdated paradigm where they think about abortion as a surgical procedure that is done by a gynecologist in a hospital. And actually, that's no longer consistent with medical and pharmaceutical reality. Um, so I'll just mention those as features that tend to be, uh, I think, um, things that help a system of abortion care to, as I said, maximize both health outcomes and human rights enjoyment. Thanks for that. Now my last question, what message would you have for people who may be shocked or disappointed, dejected that Haru and Casey may be overturned this year or soon. And, and I would ask that particularly given your efforts in the repealment of the Eighth Amendment in Ireland. So what hope or uh, silver lining or optimism on the horizon could you share? I mean, of course, the first thing I would do is express my solidarity with people in the United States who have been working for, for so long to try to secure um, access to safe quality abortion for everybody who needs it. I would also recognize that as it stands, there are many states in the United States, even with Roe and Casey, where abortion is not accessible. Um, you know, so I think we have to be clear that the on the ground situation and the constitutional situation are a bit dissonant for many people in the US anyway. But I guess the thing I would say, and people working in this field already know this, is that you know reproductive rights, reproductive justice is a journey. It's not an event. And uh, you know, half a century on from Roe, it's still being litigated. Four years on from the referendum in Ireland, we are still having to debate bills brought by anti-abortion politicians um, to try to restrict abortion in practice. It's, I am full of admiration for the medics, the activists and the lawyers 
who keep going on this. And I guess that is what I would say is we must just keep going. Um, and the truth is that women who need abortion find ways to access abortion. We, and that law does not stop people from having an abortion. It just makes it more difficult. Um, medication abortion is a game changer here and the potential for feminist networks of care to provide medication abortion uh, is something that was extremely important to women in both parts of Ireland uh, when abortion was criminalized in a very significant way. Um, and I'm sure will be very important to women in uh, particularly remote and underserved parts of the United States. A journey, not an event. I love that. And with that, there's so much I can say, but all I'll say is thank you so much for uh, coming on the show for doing this. I'm just so truly grateful to you. So thank you for uh, being on. Thank you.